Hi, I'm Emily, and I just turned 29. Years ago, I made the mistake of marrying a man with lots of problems, thinking love would fix everything. I believed I could show him how valuable he was, but I was wrong. Love is strong, but it can't make someone love themselves. I'll call my ex, Joseph. He was obsessed with making his parents happy. It wasn't just a normal desire to please them. It was an overwhelming need for their approval that influenced everything he did. Joseph's parents, who I'll call Mr. and Mrs. Ellis, didn't really care about his life, which made him desperate for their attention. It was sad to watch, and I quickly realized I couldn't fill the emotional void left by his parents. To make things worse, Joseph had a terrible habit of spending our savings on things his parents wanted. He bought them extravagant gifts, vacations, and other unnecessary stuff. Our money seemed to flow directly to Mr. and Mrs. Ellis, and their lack of appreciation made it even more frustrating for me. This reckless spending was a constant source of arguments between us. It felt like I was competing with his parents for his attention, which drained our marriage. Despite all the problems and constant arguments, I still cared about Joseph. I hoped he could free himself from his parents' unrealistic expectations and find happiness within himself. But it became clear that my love wasn't enough to help him escape their negative influence. Things took an even sharper turn one day. Joseph came to me looking serious and said he had something important to tell me. After all the ups and downs we'd been through, I prepared myself for the worst, not knowing the bombshell he was about to drop. As he started talking, I had a gut feeling this would lead to our biggest argument yet. Emily, there's something important I need to talk about, he said seriously. What's going on? I asked, already bracing myself for bad news. It's about my parents, they're retiring soon, and I want to surprise them with a luxury vacation. It's going to cost a lot, he said, looking both excited and nervous. That sounds nice as long as the money comes from your own savings. I really don't want to use our joint savings again, I said, hoping to avoid another fight about money. I don't have enough to pay for it myself. I was hoping we could use some of our savings, Joseph admitted, looking hopeful but worried. Joseph, if it's more than we can afford, maybe we should rethink this expense, I suggested gently, trying to bring him back to reality. But he got upset. You just don't understand, Emily. I love my parents and want to do something special for them. Love isn't about counting every penny. It's about grand gestures, he argued passionately. I argued, but love is also about being there for each other and making sacrifices together, not at the expense of our financial stability. This trip might be important to them, but we need to think about our future too. Joseph was determined. I have to do this for them. I thought you, of all people, would understand. They're everything to me. And you're everything to me, Joseph, but we have to be practical. We can't just use up all our savings on one trip. I tried to find a compromise, but he accused me of being selfish and not seeing the importance of his gesture. It's not about being selfish, it's about being sensible and planning for the future, I explained, wondering just how much he planned to spend. When he said he needed all of our savings, my heart sank. All of our savings, Joseph, that's just reckless, I said, shocked by his request. You mean heartless, he shot back, convinced I couldn't understand his desire to make his parents happy. No, Joseph, I'm being realistic. We can't afford to spend $85,000 on a whim, I said, my patience running out. His casual mention of getting the money back later only added to my frustration. Really, Joseph? That's not how this works, I replied, my disbelief obvious. We were at a standstill. Our views on love, responsibility, and money were completely different. The argument got louder and more intense. Suddenly, things were being thrown and breaking as if to emphasize our anger. In the midst of this chaos, Joseph declared that if I couldn't support him, he wanted a divorce. He probably expected me to panic and try to save our marriage but I didn't. Instead, I gathered all my calm and resolve and simply said, okay, Joseph, if that's truly what you want. The shock on his face was clear. He had expected tears and begging, but what he got was my firm stance. I was done in indulging his fantasies. If he wanted to waste his future chasing unrealistic dreams, he could do it without me. I didn't hold back. I told him everything. I made it clear that his endless quest for his parents' approval was pointless, like trying to stay dry in a storm with just an umbrella. He tried to argue but I stopped him with a simple raise of my hand. I declared that I was done fighting for a love trapped by unrealistic expectations and a constant need for validation. Go ahead, spend all your money trying to win over people who barely notice you, I told him firm in my decision to end the cycle of disappointments and broken promises. And with that, the harsh truth hit him. He finally realized how bad things had gotten. Our marriage had turned into a battlefield, and it was time to raise the white flag and find peace separately. A month has passed since the divorce was finalized, and I can honestly say the feeling of freedom is incredible. 
Gone are the days of endless arguments about money or seeking approval that was never ours to gain. Now I'm breathing easier, free from the heavy burden of his doubts that once darkened my days. Each new day seems a little brighter. True, Joseph has tried to sneak back into my life, pretending to be concerned and asking about my well-being, but I saw through his act. I wasn't going to fall for his tricks again. As the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I firmly turned away from Joseph's attempts to rekindle anything we once had. I had realized I'd invested too much in trying to fix someone who didn't want to change. It was time to focus on my own growth and happiness. Rebuilding wasn't easy, let me be clear. Dividing our shared assets and adjusting to a new financial reality took patience and resilience. I was used to a certain way of living, but adapting wasn't new to me. I embraced the hard work needed to rebuild my life, discovering a strength and independence I didn't know I had. Reconnecting with old friends, getting back into hobbies I'd neglected, and finding new interests made the world feel big and full of possibilities. I was eager to make the most of this fresh start. Sure, there were moments of self-doubt and loneliness, and adjusting to a new budget was challenging. The wounds from a failed marriage don't heal overnight, but with each passing day, I found comfort in the fact that I was no longer sacrificing my happiness for someone else's insecurities. The ease with which I moved forward might have been a sign that I had been holding on to a lost cause for too long. It amazed me how much I could accomplish once free from that burden. So here I was, a month later, still adjusting but flourishing all the same. Joseph's constant messaging had taken a new turn. He was now claiming to be in danger and insisting on a meeting. Tired of his relentless attempts to contact me, I decided it was time to confront the situation. In the middle of his ongoing messages, I called him. Joseph, we've been through this. We're divorced. It's time for us to move on. I said firmly. Emily, please. I just need a moment to explain. I'm in serious trouble, and you're the only one I can turn to for help, he begged. Maybe it was the long absence of his voice, or perhaps he truly sounded scared, but against my better judgment, I agreed to meet. Fine, but we're not meeting at my place. Let's go to that cafe we used to go to. No tricks, understood, I said. Thank you, Emily. I promise I just need someone to listen. You're the only one who understands me, he replied, sounding relieved. I know what you're thinking. Emily, why would you agree to meet Joseph after everything? Believe me, I questioned my own decision. Yet sometimes there's a part of us that gives in to a mix of curiosity and a lingering shred of concern, no matter how strong we are. I couldn't ignore his plea. Divorced or not, part of me still cared. So there we sat, opposite each other in the cozy cafe, surrounded by the comforting aroma of coffee. But not even the pleasant smell could ease the tension between us. Watching Joseph, with anxiety on his face and his attempts to tug at my heartstrings with those sad eyes, was almost amusing. This time, however, I wasn't swayed. Leaning back, I stayed calm and composed, ready to listen but firmly in control. I intended to steer this conversation on my terms. Okay, Joseph, you got my attention for now. What's this danger you're supposedly in? And just so you know, I'm not here to save you. I'm done cleaning up your messes, I said, keeping my tone firm yet open. Joseph sighed, deeply his face a mix of regret and desperation that was almost pitiful to see. But I steeled myself against any emotional manipulation. I know I've made mistakes before, Emily, but this situation is different. I've gotten involved with some seriously bad people. I owe them a lot of money and they're not known for their patience, he confessed. I raised an eyebrow, skeptical of his dramatic story. Really, Joseph? Dangerous people? Are we revisiting the tale of your imaginary friends who seem to attract trouble? I couldn't hide my disbelief. Joseph's expression shifted to one of hurt and frustration, evidently hoping for a more sympathetic ear. No, Emily, this isn't made up. I'm in deep trouble, and coming to you was my last resort, he insisted, his voice laced with desperation. So let me guess, you spiraled after our divorce and now you're in debt? Was it that trip you mentioned? I couldn't keep my voice down, drawing curious glances from other cafe patrons. I shot them an apologetic look, trying to regain my composure. Look, I got caught up in something foolish, I admit, but now I'm in a mess that's bigger than I can handle alone, Joseph admitted, his gaze pleading. My frustration was close to boiling over. How could he waltz back into my life with yet another crisis? Yet, underneath the anger, I couldn't completely ignore the remaining shred of empathy for him. How much are you in for? I asked, bracing myself. $145,000, Joseph responded sheepishly. $145,000, Joseph, are you out of your mind? The cafe's patrons turned their heads, their stares sharp as knives. This time, I didn't bother to offer an apology for my outburst. If they were in my shoes, hearing what I was hearing, they'd likely react the same way. Emily, please, I'm begging you. I've got nowhere else to turn. 
I know I've made a mess of things, but you're the one person who really believed in me, Joseph pleaded, his eyes shining with a sincerity that reminded me of the man I once loved. But those days were long gone, and my priority now was self-preservation, even if it meant walking away from him. Don't pull at my heartstrings, Joseph. It's way too late for that. When you said you needed help, I thought you meant $12,000, not $145,000. You've completely lost it, I responded, my voice a mix of disbelief and indignation. Overwhelmed, Joseph began to cry, oblivious to the uncomfortable glances from others. Joseph, calm down. This isn't the place for a scene. What's going to happen if you don't pay this back? I asked, trying to grasp the full extent of his predicament. They're threatening to harm me, Emily. I'm not joking. This is really bad, he managed between sobs. His words hung heavy in the air, leaving me torn between my lingering concern for his well-being and the need to protect myself from getting dragged back into his chaos. Seeing how serious things were for him, I softened my approach. All right, Joseph, start from the beginning and tell me everything, I said gently. He explained how he had tried to pay for an expensive trip for his parents. He borrowed money from a friend who let him down, leaving him with a lot of debt. As he told his story, I felt a mix of frustration at his poor choices and some reluctant amusement at how things turned out. So you borrowed money from risky people to impress your parents who haven't even noticed your efforts. Is that what happened? I asked, trying to understand. Joseph's face dropped and tears rolled down his cheeks as he admitted the harsh truth. Yes, ever since they went on that trip, it's like I don't matter to them, he said, sounding very sorry. Even though I was frustrated, I felt a bit of sympathy for him. It was a tough lesson for Joseph, and seeing him so regretful made me feel a bit compassionate. You've really gotten yourself into a tough spot, I said. Joseph, I know you don't want to hear, I told you so, but you did create this mess yourself. I warned you it wasn't a good idea, and now you chose to leave me over it, and here you are, struggling. You put everything into trying to make your parents happy, but all you got in return was silence. It's a hard lesson, but it's one you needed to learn, I said, feeling a mix of concern and resignation. This was a hard truth for both of us. Joseph had based his self-worth on people who couldn't appreciate his sacrifices, and I had to accept that I couldn't protect him from his own choices anymore. I hoped that facing these tough consequences would show him that I had always been on his side. But his need for parental approval was his downfall. As we sat in silence, the weight of our past, filled with broken promises and dreams, was heavy. I realized it was time to let go completely. No more second chances, no more trying to fix what was beyond repair. Joseph needed to face the results of his actions alone, and I needed to move on and find my own happiness. I hope you find a way out of this, Joseph, I said, my voice firm with finality. You're not going to help, Joseph asked, looking surprised. No, I'm not, I replied. Joseph, I can't help you. Why not, he asked, because I don't have the money to bail you out, and even if I did, taking on a huge loan that I'd be paying off for years isn't an option. I can't afford to be as reckless as you've been, I explained firmly. Come on, Emily, please. I'm begging you, he said, his desperation clear. Joseph, expecting me to fix this for you, especially with how you're acting, isn't realistic, I said, my patience wearing thin. Yeah, I did expect that. You're my ex-wife, not my enemy, he replied, still holding on to hope. But it was clear our lives had gone in different directions. My focus now was on finding my own peace and happiness, separate from the chaos we once shared. And that's the problem, Joseph. You expect me to always be there to clean up your mess because that's what I used to do. I was your wife, so helping you out of trouble was something I did naturally. But I can't and shouldn't keep doing that. It's not my responsibility anymore. After everything, I don't owe you anything, especially considering how our money was wasted on your ungrateful and toxic parents. But I love them, Joseph said. But I love myself too. And loving myself means doing what's best for me, including taking care of my own well-being, I said. Joseph looked down, realizing that he wasn't going to get the help he wanted from me. Since it seems like you're out of options, here's one piece of advice. Leave. Move somewhere far away where they can't find you. If you can't do that, I'm not sure what else you expect from me. He sat there in silence, clearly frustrated by my refusal to help him this time. It's time for us to go our separate ways, Joseph. I can't keep being dragged back into your problems. We both need to find our own peace, I said, hoping he would understand. If you really cared about me, you'd help, he said, anger in his voice. Goodbye, Joseph. I'm changing my number, I said firmly as I stood up to leave. As I walked away, Joseph stayed seated, his face showing a mix of emotions. It was a tough but necessary step for me to take for my own happiness and self-respect, 